So good morning. Uh, well, today we have a fun topic, suicide. Um, actually, I didn't realize how much interest there is among students in suicide. Um, once we uh, invited a professor from Australia who wanted to teach a course on death and suicide. And I was very concerned that no students will take it. And the class was full. So it looks like suicide is a popular topic. And I think I know why, because when I was your age, occasionally it occurred to my mind, what if I commit suicide? Right? So I think thinking about suicide is probably something what crossed many of your mind. Uh, and therefore, hopefully, uh, Durkheim will be exciting for you and will help you to understand why did you consider it and why did you, you did not do it, right? Or why your um, friends or acquaintances thought about it. Some of them may have tried. Some of them may have killed themselves. Anyway, so this is about suicide. And as I said already before, um, uh, this is a path-breaking book uh, in many ways. Uh, it's really the first rigorous empirical study um, of a social phenomenon, and a very curious social phenomenon. And we will talk about this uh, as the lecture unfolds, because we tend to think about suicide as something very personal, right, and individual. And all right, if a psychologist is interested in suicide, is understandable. But why on earth a sociologist would be interested in suicide? It is so rare, socially, fortunately. Uh, I mean, not in some societies, but in most, very rare. And it looks like it's so much a question of individual decision. So why should? Um, a social scientist try to explain it. So Durkheim sets for himself a very difficult task and he does it formidably. I will show you that he does some spectacular methodological uh, innovations. Um, he kind of offers methodological insights what social scientists are excited about even today. Uh, uh, well over a century after he published this book. Okay, so that's about suicide. And first of all, I will ask a few general questions. Um, uh, and first of all, the question is, what is suicide? When, when do we uh, decide uh, that a death is suicide? And then also, I would like to pose the question, uh, what are... Um, uh, uh, the, what are the reasons for social scientists to study it? And Durkheim gives some very good reasons. And finally, I will introduce Durkheim's typology of suicide. Many Durkheim sc scholars were struggling with this, how to make sense of this typology. And I will show you uh, one um, uh, way how to do it. Sort of, there are uh, his major. Uh, uh, types uh, are egoistic, altruistic, anomic, and fatalistic suicide, and I will talk about each of them in turn. Okay, so let me start with the definition. And this is tricky, by the way. Uh, also, it's extremely tricky um, uh, when it comes to statistics to figure out uh, what statistics do report as suicide uh, when people die, um, especially if they do not leave a letter behind, it's very hard to decide whether that person actually committed suicide or it was just an accident. Well, there are occasions when this is quite obvious, right? Somebody's hanging himself and or herself, uh, which is a favorite way of, of committing suicide of certain type of people in certain uh, 
instances, right? And the way how somebody hanged himself makes it quite clear that it was a suicide. But doctors investigating the cause of death very often are puzzled uh, whether this is suicide or not. So uh, you clearly have an overdose of sleeping pills. It's unclear whether it was an accident. Accidentally, um, you took more pills than you should have or whether this was actually a suicide. Uh, so there is um, a lot of problem in studying statistical data about suicide. Um, um, and very often, um, doctors do make judgments uh, um, on the social circumstances of the person who committed suicide. Right? Uh, they read Durkheim, or they have read some social scientist, they tell these are the kind of people under these circumstances who, who commit suicide. So they go to the scene, they look at uh, the dead person, uh, look at the circumstances. This is an old man uh, whose wife just passed away very recently, so that must be, of course, suicide, right? So therefore, what is suicide is being defi de defined by the circumstances rather than actually uh, by uh, the uh, uh, medical reasons. Okay, so let, let's try to st struggle a little bit this. What is suicide? Under what circumstances can we talk about suicide? And here is uh, um, uh, Durkheim's definition. The term suicide right, is applied to all cases of death resulting directly or indirectly a positive or a negative act of the victim himself, which he knows will produce these results. Well, uh, looks like a very complicated definition, but a very full and a very good one. Uh, and the first point is uh, intention, right? Uh, that in order to call a death suicide, uh, there must be intention uh, on behalf of the person uh, who commits a suicide. Well, this intention can be very uh, 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 well. <coughs> uh, the aim might not be necessarily self-destruction. Uh, uh, the aim may be something else. Uh, for instance, uh, you can think about suicide bombers, right? Uh, they don't want to kill themselves. They want to kill others, but they use their body as a weapon, right? And they explode themselves in order to cause harm to others, right? But that's clearly a case of suicide because they know that they will die um, as a consequence of their action. And therefore, it can be called suicide, though it uh, uh, is not aimed uh, at the person himself. Well, uh, well, the act of suicide can be indirect, uh, um, uh, uh, and in fact, it can be, can be negative. Uh, sort of you, most suicide is uh, a direct and positive action, right? Uh, you jump from the 40th floor, right? And then uh, 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 you, you kill yourself. You take sleeping pills and overdose and you kill yourself. Uh, but it can be indirect and negative. I mean, you can starve yourself to death. Uh, uh, and that can be called suicide as long as your intention is to kill yourself, right? Um, so it becomes very tricky. Uh, uh, what do you do with people who are abusing drugs or alcohol, right? Uh, they uh, may actually die as a result of excessive alcohol or drug, drug consumption. Uh, if it is not intentional, uh, they don't want to kill themselves, they just like boozing, right? They just like cocaine, right? Um, uh, 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 then it is not suicide, right? <laughs> uh, 
And there are lots of Russians who have been dying um, in the last uh, 35 years. There are numbers, especially um, middle-aged Russian men were dying like flies because they are drinking too much vodka. In the overwhelming majority of the cases, it is not suicide, right? They are depressed. They are silly. They think drinking vodka will help their depression. And as a result, they will get liver cancer and they will die, right? So it was not suicide. Uh, well, if you lock yourself into your room, you take sleeping pills and you drink a um, bottle of vodka in order to kill yourself, <laughs> then it was suicide, right? So uh, anyway, uh, you have to know the consequences of your action. You have to know that what you do will kill yourself in order for your act uh, to qualify as a suicide. So I think this is really beautifully, beautifully done um, and uh, uh, has been extremely influential uh, for uh, uh, a social scientist. Uh, as I said, it makes a, a, a very big challenge to medical investigators who try to determine the cause of death um, uh, because uh, it's very difficult to establish the intention, right? Uh, uh, and in most of the cases of suicide, you cannot be absolutely sure of the intention. You don't know whether this was an accident or whether it was intentional, unless uh, the victim of the suicide will tell you, uh, leaves a letter behind and tells that I committed suicide. Okay. Uh, now, uh, as I said, it looks like that suicide is very much a very personal action, right? Uh, 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 well, occasionally people talk about their intention to commit suicide. When and if they do so, they probably will not do it. Right? Uh, those who are serious about suicide keep it to themselves and then kill themselves. Those who talk about, be, I am suicidal, very often simply want to have attention, right? Um, and uh, then, even if they attempt suicide, you know, it's of, often it's kind of fake, you know. Uh, they smart enough, they just take a little overdose of sleeping pill, but not too much. And because they already told they are suicidal, right? their friend rushes them to the hospital and they will be all right, right? So anyway, uh, um, uh, uh, it's a very individual act. You usually keep your intention to commit suicide to yourself rather than discussing with somebody else. And it looks like, you know, taking your life away um, uh, is really uh, your own, own business. Um, so the question is, why on earth People who study society should be interested in this very individual, very private act. And, uh, well, he said, look, uh, look at, for instance, the suicide rate, how it varies across countries. And he said there is a tremendous difference in suicide rate across countries. There are countries which are very low, and the other countries with very, very high suicide rate, relatively speaking. I mean, suicide is uh, nowhere the top ranking cause of deaths. Though in some countries, you know, and in certain age groups, it can easily enter the top five causes of deaths. And on top of this, those countries uh, where people commit suicide tend to be countries where people committed suicide for a long time. It's a very stable indicator. Uh, Scandinavian countries are ones where usually suicide rate is reasonably high. My native uh, Hungary is a country which for a very long time was proud of being number one in committing suicide. Right? Uh, uh, well, uh, Incidentally, um, this is not in Durkheim, but if I may add to this, uh, there were people who were, of course, you know, 
Durkheim inspired and still inspires a lot of research on suicide. He has been challenged on many um, questions, but he is still, you know, after 110 years, the agenda setter on suicide research. If any one of you become a biologist, a sociologist, a doctor, and want to conduct research on suicide, you will have to cite Durkheim, right? You have to start from Durkheim if you are studying this. But anyway, um, there were people that were inspired by him and looked further inside countries. And what is interesting that we see in countries there are actually gigantic differences between regions. Uh, there are some regions in these countries with very high and some regions on, of these countries with relatively low suicide rates. And these are pretty constant as such. Uh, well, I had a colleague, uh, as I said, you know, it's probably not too parochial for me to refer to Hungary because now Hungary is, I think, only number two or three in the world in suicide rate, but has been number one for a century. So anyway, I had a colleague who did a, a detailed study in, in Hungary about suicide inspired by Durkheim and found uh, that there were certain regions uh, in, in the country where the suicide rate were particularly high elsewhere it was low. And he actually could identify uh, the type of people who committed suicide and the way how they committed suicide, for instance. And that has been stable for a century, as far as it was possible to go back in statistics. Just to give you an example, and it will uh, also help us when we are looking at uh, Durkheim's typology of suicide. For instance, he found that, uh, you know, f male farmers, um, old male farmers uh, living in detached farms, uh, when their wife passes away unexpectedly, women are expected to live longer than men, right? Uh, when their wife passes away unexpectedly, the typical way what men does, they hang themselves in the attic. And this happens again and again. Detached farms Old man, wife died, people go up and hang themselves, right? Uh, suicide, to put in another way, is a way of dying, right? There are some circumstances in which in certain societies uh, you know that this is the answer to your problem, that you commit suicide, right? Right, if you are men, you know, we are usually pretty dumb, we don't know how to cook, we don't know how to take care of ourselves, you know, you are old, your wife died, so what do you do? You commit suicide, right? Under certain circumstances, right? Anyway, I think this is, a, uh, this is why it makes it interesting, right, for social scientists, that there are interesting social patterns, cultural patterns, how people commit suicide. And, you know, uh, Durkheim will work on this as much. And then he said there are in fact large, big historical events which do have an, an impact on suicide rates. You would think if there is a big social turmoil, then suicide rate will go up. You are wrong. If there is big social turmoil, <laughs> suicide rate tends to be going down because there is, in times of revolution, people don't commit suicide. Anyway, his point is that suicide is a collective phenomenon, right? Somehow it is socially determined as a phenomenon. Okay, now this is the typology of suicide. And I have been struggling with this, and um, uh, uh, people who know much more about Durkheim have been struggling with this typology. Um, and... Uh, uh, what, of course, I was trying to do, as others were trying to do, to do a two-by-two two table, right? And to put these types of suicide in this two-by-two two table. Durkheim, in writing about suicide, seemed to make a distinction between uh, uh, the question of integration and regulation, right? Integration means, you know, how tightly organized the group or society is in which you live. 
right? And that, as uh, I already pointed out, you know, in the earlier lecture, right? Durkheim has this idea of normal versus pathological. And I will talk about this in more detail um, uh, on the last lecture on, on Durkheim's uh, 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 methodology. Uh, uh, he has this interesting idea that what is normal is the kind of typical. Uh, to put it very crudely, normal is the kind of the average. If it is too much or too little, this is pathological or abnormal. That is the idea. So, therefore, one dimension in which what, uh, he, he uses the typology is integration, right? How well integrated we are into a social group we are in. Now, that can be too high or can be too low, right? And both too high integration and too low integration can uh, be the cause of social pathologies. And one of the social pathologies is that you kill yourself. Right? Um, and the other uh, dimension is regulation. Um, uh, how much, how tight, how rigorous the norms are which regulate your behavior. Again, it can be too high or it can be too low. Um, and it will uh, uh, affect also pathologies. You know, if you are away from uh, the golden middle road, right? That's what uh, you know Durkheim's idea of normality is. If you are on the golden uh, middle road, then you are normal. If you deviate, you are abnormal. <coughs> this is a very problematic proposition in Durkheim and uh, has been challenged. Now the big trouble is are these two dimensions independent from each other? Or they overlap? And um, it's really, they are not really uh, completely independent from each other. This is why you could not put this into a two by two table, right? Uh, because uh, uh, you um, uh, some of the types of abnormalities can be only understood in integration or in, in, in terms of regulation. But anyway, I think this is probably uh, the best way I can come up with, or in the Durkheim literature, the best way I have read, uh, basically using this uh, two dimensions uh, as uh, 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 not, not as a two by two table, sort of. To put, to put it this way, uh, it's uh, rather than a two by two table, it's like, you know, two dimensions, right? And then you have the types over here, right? Too high and too low, right? And you have integration, integration, and uh, uh, you have regulation. And and, and, and high and low and high and low. This is how you can do it, right? You can conceptualize it, but it's, I tr you know, it doesn't work. You put in a normal two by two table. Okay. Well, let me start to talk about egoistic suicide, right? Uh, and therefore, right? Egoistic suicide has something to do with social integration, and it is a case when the social integration is too low. Um, and he said, well, uh, the more weakened the group to which uh, the person who commits suicide belongs, the less he depends on them. We could, um, and he caused this egoism, right? If you don't, you know, you, you are yourself and you are not, do not feel responsible uh, to your own group. Uh, and uh, 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 therefore, you may be uh, committing suicide. Um, again, you know, people who are considering suicide uh, 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 just to show uh, the lack of egoism and the importance of the group uh, 
Well, you may think you have a good enough reason to kill yourself. You know, my life doesn't have any purpose. You know, my um, boy or girlfriend left me, so therefore I'd rather kill myself. And then they say, well, I can't really do this to mom, right? Uh, right? I, I cannot disappoint my, my parents, right? So therefore, you, are not, you cannot act egoistically, right? You belong to a group. And because the tightness, uh, the solidarity with the group prevents you to commit suicide. So in order ego to act egoistically means that you don't care about others or you, don't, you care first of all about yourself uh, as such. Now the solidarity can be different. It can be um, religion, um, it can be family, or it can be the society. Uh, and uh, uh, let me uh, speak to this, uh, you know, and if this uh, uh, religion, family, or society as such offers sufficient solidarity, then you will not be likely um, to commit uh, uh, suicide. Uh, okay, so let me uh, uh, talk about uh, religion and, uh, and suicide, and also uh, a bit about... Uh, uh, how um, religion and education are linked together with suicide. Durkheim does here something really past breaking. Uh, though the statistical technologies were not available, he really do, does the logic of multivariate statistical analysis. Uh, he almost does a regression model, to put it this way, without numbers. But that's, that's the logic of the argument. And then he's talking about what he calls the Jewish exceptionalism. Um, uh, well, this will be uh, interesting because the fundamental idea is that, in fact, generally, uh, people who are more educated are more likely to commit suicide. Right? Uh, there is also a relationship between religion and, uh, and, uh, and suicide. Protestants are more likely to commit suicide. Catholics less likely to commit suicide. Catholics are less educated. Protestants are more educated. To being more educated than Protestant makes you more susceptible to commit suicide, he argues. But Jews are an exception because Jewish suicide rate is generally very low. And Jews are very highly educated. So that's the Jewish puzzle, right? By your nurse, highly educated Jews don't kill themselves. If you are, right, a Lutheran or, you know, a Presbyterian and you are educated, you kill yourself, right? Why Jews don't, right? That's the puzzle, you know? What is the relationship between education and religion? And why on earth education leads to higher level of suicide? Uh, okay, let me therefore uh, start with this one. Well, um, as I said, uh, uh, he generally finds that uh, there is a higher rate of um, suicide among Protestants and lower rates uh, among Catholics. And Jews have the lowest suicide rate among uh, the Judeo-Christian uh, uh, sphere. Of, of the world. That's what he studied, the European countries. Uh, um, in fact, Islamic uh, uh, suicide rate is also uh, uh, low. Uh, well, uh, uh, one possible easy answer would be that, uh, you know, there are stricter penalties if you are Catholic and if you commit suicide. That's why you don't commit suicide, right? But that's not quite true, other kind of use, right? Um, in fact, all religions uh, are against suicide. No religion allows suicide. Well, Roman Catholics may be a little more uh, uh, rigorous about it, you know. Uh, you do not get a religious burial. Uh, I think most Roman Catholic priests would not bury somebody uh, who committed suicide in most countries. Uh, uh, well, while uh, Protestant ministers may, may perform uh, a burial ceremony, 
But I don't think, you know, if you commit suicide, it really, <laughs> really all that concern where and how you will be buried, right? Uh, now, so the question is why, right? The, the first answer is that some religions prohibit re uh, suicide more than others. It's not very persuasive because all religions prohibit suicide. Well, and here, here comes with the idea of integration. He said Protestantism is less strongly integrated church than the Catholic Church, less of a community. Um, and uh, Judaism actually even more tightly integrated, even more so of a community. So therefore it leaves relatively little room for egoistic suicide because the high level of integration and here the rank order is relatively low level among Protestants, higher level among Catholics, and particularly high among uh, Jews. Well, uh, how on earth comes education into uh, the, the picture? Well, he says, uh, uh, as uh, uh, the common and cost customary prejudices weakening that is an increase in the trend of suicide. Well, uh, it's not exactly prejudice in the most conventional sense of the term uh, what he's referring to. Uh, he's referring here to uh, the question what we kind of overcome with uh, education generally speaking, right? Um, that if you are becoming more educated, you will have less of accepted doctrines, right? Education, right, is a critical exercise, right? That's what I was trying to do in this course, right? To challenge you, right, to be a critical theorist, right? To subject your own consciousness to critical scrutiny, and to subject the theories you have read to critical scrutiny, right? That's why I asked you in the test to do, uh, uh, find a puzzle, right? And take sides in this puzzle. Offer some criticism of uh, uh, some of the theories. That's what education is all about. And therefore, prejudice is dogma is declining, right? And if dogma is declining, there are less uh, given stereotypes for us we believe in, uh, then uh, we are more likely to commit suicide. This is a kind of weakening, right, of the collective conscience. It's becoming more of an individual consciousness. The critical thinker is becoming more of an individual um, uh, 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 consciousness. Well, and he said, well, they go together with religion uh, because Catholics tended to be less educated than Protestants, more educated. I don't know how much this still stands up to scrutiny, but that's certainly true that traditionally um, Protestant churches did attribute a greater emphasis uh, uh, to education. One big reason was uh, 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 the relationship between uh, believers uh, uh, and, uh, and the clergyman, right? And the classical Roman Catholic theology, like the clergyman interprets the Bible, right? Uh, for the believer, believers. The big, right, revolution of Reformation was that they translated the Bible, right, into native languages, and printing was just made available and started to print the Bible. And they wanted lay people to read the Bible. Well, in medieval Roman Catholic uh, Church, uh, only the priest read the Bible, right? Uh, sort of Protestantism went together with mass education, massive public education, and an emphasis on education, how to read and write, right? Uh, so, uh, therefore, uh, I think that is a good, good claim to be made, that on the long run, and generally speaking, Protestants tended to be more educated than Catholics. 
I doubt you know, whether you would find much religious differences in contemporary societies. But that was, you know, that in a way was simply a correlation pointing in the same direction. Um, and he, he also makes this point, which is by now utterly untrue, right? Women are not less educated in advanced societies than men. Women are actually by now more educated than men in the advanced Western countries, including the United States. Right? In no time, you guys, uh, you really have to work harder to make sure that you can catch up with the ladies, right? Because they will be better educated than you will be, right? Uh, but anyway, in his times, women were less educated than men, and they were less likely to commit suicide. I think that's also still the case. I think women are still less, generally speaking, still less likely to commit suicide. In fact, I think women are more likely to attempt suicide, but completed suicide rate is much higher among men than among women. Right? That's, I think, the basic finding. But anyway, here uh, it's more a methodological point. I don't, I doubt that whether the Catholic-Protestant uh, distinction still stands, and it certainly doesn't stand for women. Right? Women by now. Um, in the Western advanced countries, in almost every country, are better educated than men are. As, especially the younger generation are better educated. Um, but the methodological point is interesting, right? As I said, he's beginning to do multivariate analysis, right? So the dependent variable is tendency to suicide, and he has a little, you know, regression model, right? He looks into the regression model countries and gender, and education um, uh, and religion and tries to explain the variance in the suicide rate. Uh, I mean, uh, in terms of research design, this is very beautifully done, right? This is social science, right, uh, as we know it uh, uh, today. Well, and there is the Ju Judaistic puzzle, right? Uh, well, Jews, I think that's probably still true, it's better educated than non-Jews. Uh, again, I would not swear on it. I, I really have not looked at data on religion and education, but certainly generally has been true at, at that time uh, when uh, Durkheim was writing about late 19th century. Jews were uh, highly educated uh, in Europe in particular, uh, and by the 1920s and 30s in the United States as well. Uh, uh, do uh, they are highly educated? Uh, well, they are less likely to commit suicide. So there is a trouble, right, with his explanatory model, right? Uh, what's going on here? Um, and then uh, um, he uh, uh, tries to understand what is the purpose of learning. And he said the purpose of learning among Jews is different. And that's the claim. Jew seeks to learn not in order to replace his collective prejudices, but merely to better armed for the struggle. Right? So, uh, you read the Talmud, right? You go to the rabbi and you go through uh, all kind of education to better understand the Holy Scripture, right? and the interpretations of the Holy Scripture, right? You got a lot of education, right? If you are preparing yourself for your bar mitzvah, right? You even have to learn Hebrew, right? To pass your bar, bar mitzvah. You sweat blood probably, meanwhile, while doing so, right? Um, but this is not to challenge the doctrine. It is to better understand the doctrine, right? And therefore, it doesn't undermine the collective conscience. This education strengthens the collective conscience, right? I think that's at least Durkheim's claim. Very Again, I think take it methodologically. I think methodologically formidable what this guy is doing, uh, right? As early as uh, 1897, right? This is the kind of stuff today, if uh, 
any one of you will do a PhD, right, in political science or economics or sociology, you have the kind, the kind, this kind of research design, your mentor will say, go for it. That's the right way to do it, right? Anyway, so that's... Uh, so, um, uh, well, he says, uh, education, therefore, it's a very interesting uh, idea, right? He now does a kind of interaction effect, right, between education and religion. And he looks at this interaction effect, how these two affect each other. He said it depends, you know, what uh, um, education is all about, you know. Education, if it is um, weakening the collective conscience, uh, makes you just critical of everything what you learned, uh, will be the, the cause of suicide. Otherwise, it's actually um, uh, uh, important to uh, um, uh, reinforce uh, 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 you in society. And now family and suicide. This is the point that I, I did make, right? Um, uh, uh, in fact, you know, if you are integrated in a, in a, uh, 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 in a family, you are less likely uh, to uh, commit uh, uh, suicide. And he said, well, uh, there should be, if that is true, there should be some uh, uh, evidence that people who are married uh, uh, will be uh, less likely to kill themselves than people who are unmarried and widowed. And that is actually the, the case. Uh, 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 generally, by the way, marriage seems to have a, uh, a health advantage. Right? Uh, uh, if you are considering you know, never to get married, think about your health. Right? Um, uh, 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 if, you, if you get married, uh, statistics will tell you you will live longer. And actually, they also tell you you will live happier than if you stay alone. Um, well, and you probably are less likely to um, uh, commit suicide. So that's what he called matrimonial immunity to suicide. Why, he says. And this is, again, incredible what, he, what the guy is doing here, right? He said, well, one possible explanation is that, you know, um, because, you know, you are in a community, right, therefore you will not commit suicide. I cannot do to my spouse to kill myself because my spouse will blame him or herself for my death and I don't want to cause harm to my spouse, right? Therefore I don't commit suicide. I said young people often don't commit suicide with respect to, uh, to their, their parents. But he said... And this is really extraordinary. He said that it can be caused by matrimonial selection. Right? People uh, who are more likely to commit suicide to begin with may not marry. Well, those of you who took statistics classes, you know what he's talking about. Though at that time, this was not in statistics at all. It is called the selection problem, right? This is exactly the selection problem. He said, we cannot really tell why people who are married um, are less likely to commit suicide because it is possible people with intention to commit suicide will not get married, right? Because they are lonely people to begin with, and this is why they do, did not marry. So the lower frequency of suicide among married people is not the consequence of marriage, but marriage is the consequence of people's likelihood not to commit suicide. This is the classical example, what is called the sample selection problem, right? Um, and the only, you know, what the only solution for this is. Uh, experimental method, right? That's the only way how you could deal with this, to solve the problem, right? Um, and if you uh, uh, took with Professor Green, a uh, uh, political science uh, course, you know exactly what I mean, right? Social scientists really should do experiment random assignments. You could really come rid of the problem of these uh, 
um, uh, sample selection bias, if you could randomly assign people to get married or not to get married, and then they will get married or not to get married, and then to see whether it had an effect or not. Unfortunately, in society, we can't really do random assignments, right? We hardly can assign people to get married or not to get married and follow it up 30 years later whether they are still alive, right? That's the problem. Uh, but, and otherwise, there is really statisticians to all kinds of big tricks around this, but it really cannot be so. The real solution would be only the experimental method. But what is formidable about this, right, that he is well ahead of himself. You know, I, the whole problem of, uh, you know, sample selection issue, I came across of this uh, in statistics in the 1980s. That's when it became a big thing, the 1980s, sample selection model how you control for the sample selection problem. And he knew about the problem, not the statistical one, but the research design problem, right, in 1897. Okay. But he said, well, there is still data uh, which supports actually uh, that matrimonialism effect. Well, society, the same, uh, that's counterintuitive. He said if there are great social disturbances, then actually social sentiments are at high. Revolution, right? You feel identified with your country and the revolutionary cause and you do not commit suicide. If otherwise, you would have committed suicide. Therefore, suicide rate will be going down. Uh, so anyway, uh, um, this was about egoistic suicide. Now, let me... Uh, I am running out of time very badly. Uh, uh, altruistic suicide. Well, altruistic suicide is uh, happening when social integration is far too high, uh, unbearably high. And that's when people will be committing what he calls altruistic suicide. Um, uh, and this can happen, uh, for instance, he said, uh, People, old men, uh, the example what I gave in old age, uh, uh, commit suicide. Um, uh, women, occasionally on the death of their husband, commit suicide because they think this is expected from them. And traditionally, often followers or servants on the death of the chief committed suicide. So uh, we are talking about altruistic suicide because people commit suicide because they think it is their duty to kill themselves, right? Um, and this is a, a, a sacrifice which is imposed by society for something like a social end, right? It can be obligatory in certain societies. Uh, uh, you know, if you lost um, a battle uh, and you were a Japanese soldier, right? You committed harakiri, you know, if you heard the general, even in the um, Second World War, they committed harakiri, killed themselves. Um, uh, uh, or uh, it actually can be even kind of mystical suicide. For instance, uh, as you know, Hindus occasionally jump into the Ganges River to kill themselves. Uh, uh, well, today he said this is a relatively rare an incident, but it happens in the army. He says soldiers kill themselves not because they are not sufficiently integrated, but because they are highly integrated, and therefore that individualism is weak, and that's why they commit suicide. And now um, about uh, 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 anomic suicide, right? Well, you know, anomie, anomie is the lack uh, uh, of social regulation. And indeed, he said, if you find yourself in ever-changing situations where the value system is changing, you are likely uh, to, uh, more likely to commit uh, suicide. Um, uh, and, uh, well, it can be a reason for uh, 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 economic reasons. Uh, traditional institutions decline, uh, suicide during the Great Depression as the bank uh, uh, collapsed uh, was frequent. People were jumping out of the window. Uh, it actually, a few of them happened also last fall with the turn down of the real stock market. 
And it can be, you know, uh, 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 another good example is domestic enemy. You get uh, your spouse dies, uh, or you get divorced, uh, um, then uh, suicide rate is frequent. And finally, fatalistic suicide. Um, it, as I pointed out, uh, Durkheim's notion of fatalism is a twin concept to Marx's notion of alienation. That is too much regulation and not enough social integration. Uh, uh, such as the case of uh, slaves or childless uh, women, uh, then they tend to commit suicide as well. So, so much about Durkheim and suicide. And next lecture, again, I will talk to the questions briefly before we go on Durkheim's methodology. So, do come, you know, it will be helpful for the test. Uh, uh, and I appreciate, actually, your class attendance. It was wonderful all along. <laughs>